Woo! What was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Well, folks, here we go. Grand Rising. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much to our musicians who add so much to our Sunday morning experience. <laughs> yeah, aren't we blessed by this beautiful spiritual family that we get to spend every Sunday morning with, and sometimes Wednesday, and sometimes Monday, and sometimes Friday. We, we have lots of things going on. Whew. My name is Dr. Alice Reed, and I am the spiritual leader here at this community, and, and I'm really happy to be with you here today. We um, have been, uh, well, before I get into that, I love our new website. We have things that start at 6 o'clock, we have things that start at 7 p.m., we have things that start at 6.30, and it's so easy. Friday, I was here Friday night, and I wanted to grab some dinner before our curtain, and so I just went to the website, clicked on the events link, and there was the time, and it's a beautiful list. It's so different than your last experience. So if you've not been to our website lately, check it out. It's informative. It really is informative now. So um, thank you, Pam. Thank you, Mary, our, our webmistress, Deb Foley. Um, our wonderful prior architect, Francie Kennedy. We did a lot of work over a long period of time, and it's, it's really useful now. So I'm just check it out, check it out. Okay, I can take this note off my note. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to share my joy with that. Um, we are talking this month about the um, imperf the perf Oh boy, what's the, give me the slide. <laughs> what's the monthly theme? <laughs> Practice makes imperfect. Practice makes imperfect. And we've been looking at imperfection and perfection all month. We've, um, and today we're looking at how practicing imperfection really can be an expansive experience. I was um, noticing all the buzz around the Olympics, right? There's been some really amazing things going on. People are really excited. They're coming together. And I was thinking how perfect it is that every year when we have a presidential election, we also have the, the Olympics happening at the same time. <laughs> and the politics that seem to, you know, get very competitive and divide us are like antithetical to the Olympics, which is also a com competitive um, event, but that seems to unite us. Right, is that cool? Like, can you see what I'm talking about? Like, we're, here we have this thing called competition, and we have very different experiences with it in these different venues, these different contexts. And um, it reminds me of our philosophy where we teach this idea that the experiences that we have are very dependent upon the landscape we create for those experiences through our consciousness, through our thinking, through our feeling, through, our, through the, the, the choices that we always have. When I first came to this philosophy, I had done quite a bit of spiritual practice. I had worked with many different um, philosophies, doctrines, I had really been doing my searching work for many years, and when I finally showed up in a Science of Mind Center, I learned something that none of the other doctrines were able to give me, and that was that my thoughts did not rule me. I ruled them. And I didn't learn that anywhere else, not even in the school. I really thought that I was the... the um, I was going to use the word victim, but that's not the right word. I just really thought I was at the mercy of my thoughts. And when I came to this philosophy, I learned that I could choose what I wanted to think. I could direct my thinking in a way that was abundant and generous and loving. And I could use my values to bring it all together. And so when we look at this idea of um, competition, 
I want you to make note of that as we move through the rest of this election process, that that same competition is happening at the Olympics, and it's beautiful, and it's powerful, and it's connecting, and it's uplifting. Gosh, what if we could have that experience around our politics? I need to stop. I know, <laughs> I know where you're going. Like, no way is what we're thinking. But why not? Why not? It's possible. It's totally possible. But I think it, it's dependent upon the individuals that were, you know, who, and, the, and the type of mindset or consciousness they bring to it, right? These athletes bring a mindset to the Olympics of fair play and rooting for each other and, of course, wanting to win, but also really respecting each other, respecting the sport, respecting the, the very... Um, what it really means to be an Olympian athlete shoulder to shoulder with people that you might be competing with. It's a beautiful ideal and an example of, of, of that we could follow. I was thinking about this topic and I was remembering when Jeffrey, my teacher, Jeffrey Proctor, Dr. Jeffrey Proctor, and he, he told me the story about being somewhere and he saw this fella with a tattoo on his arm and it was on his forearm and it was in big letters, you know, tattoos are forever, right? And it was in big letters and it said, impermanence. Think about that. It's a permanent tattoo, impermanence. <laughs> impermanence. And I, and I was thinking about that because so much of what we experience feels heavy and thick and permanent and real, and yet everything we experience changes. Everything we move through changes. Everything we think changes at some point or another. And there's a lot of um, concern and spinning out in the universe and people are engaged and passionate or maybe you're over it <laughs> already. <laughs> people are like scared and some people are really certain and everything in between. And yet these um, conditions that we're witnessing out in the world are impermanent. And I'm remembering, I want to bring back that quote I used a couple of weeks ago from A Course in Miracles because it speaks to this and in, in, in speaks volumes actually. The Course writes, we are not human beings seeking a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings who think we're having a human experience. We're spiritual beings who are so convinced that we're having a, a human experience that we have lost touch with our spiritual nature. We have completely immersed ourselves in the condition of being a human being, and yet it's impermanent. It is an impermanent uh, state of being. And, I, and if you've been paying attention, if you're new to our community, welcome. If you've been paying attention to what's been going on in our community, we've really stepped up our spiritual practice in a lot of different ways. Our, min our uh, ministers and practitioners, our whole ecclesiastical leadership team has been studying Emma Curtis Hop Hopkins together. And so we've been really deepening our roots to this teaching by working with um, Emma Curtis Hopkins. And then the, um, the other things that are happening, we're visioning every Tuesday morning. It's a small but mighty group. We're doing that spiritual practice. We're doing kirtan, which is just chanting once a month. We're also um, doing yoga twice a week where we have individuals who have the opportunity to really get in touch with their, with their body temple. And we're also doing these amazing sound bath healings once a month. And all of that is working collectively in our community. And it's, it's working on us individually, but it's also working on us collectively. And I'm finally starting to feel some of the results of that. I'm feeling a 
if, if you are a practitioner of this teaching, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. I feel like I have stepped into a slipstream and that everything is in order, even when it doesn't look like it's in order, perfectly imperfect. I have difficult people I have to deal with. I have difficult decisions I have to make. I have things that are all happening at the same time. And yet it doesn't feel like work. It doesn't feel like effort. And it really is the result of spiritual practice. It really is the result of creating what Ernest Holmes called a mental equivalent. And he has a whole chapter that is dedicated to that mental equivalent. So I want to read a little bit of that to you. Sometimes, sometimes when I'm looking for inspiration, I just pop open the book and I always find exactly what I need. Because Ernest Holmes talks about the mental equivalent, but he also brings it into context of faith. And if you are, you know, if you were brought up in, a, in another faith, if you were brought up in another spiritual tradition, oftentimes faith is referred to as, um, I think sometimes it gets, it gets mixed up with hoping and wishing but not here. When we talk about faith, we're not talking about hoping or wishing or having, you know, happy thoughts that we hope will happen. When we're working with faith, we're really working with that power that makes the grass grow, that understanding that there is a creative process that we are always using that is always looking for an outlet, and we have the opportunity to be that outlet. So um, Ernest Holmes says this, no class of people on earth believes more in prayer than we do. Our whole theory is based not only on the belief in spirit, but in the availability of it, its immediate response. We even go so far as to say in everyday language, pray right and God cannot help responding. This is as far as anyone can go in faith. He goes on to say, faith is the power of prayer. And you may ask, what is faith? When you analyze faith, you find that it is a mental attitude against which there is no longer any contradiction. I'm going to say that again. You find it is a mental attitude against which there is no longer any contradiction in mind that entertains it. So when we're talking about faith, we're talking about embodying a belief. We're talking about embodying an understanding about how the, God, how the universe works and how it works in tandem with our human condition. And so if I go back to that example of the Olympics versus um, uh, politics and that the two things they have in common are competition, what happens is we have this embodied faith about the Olympics, don't we? We have this embodied faith that in the Olympics, uh, the Olympians will, you know, respect each other and they will do their best and we'll have pride in all the winners and the losers. And what's the embodied faith we have around politics? <laughs> yeah, I don't think we have the same embodied faith around and the, the politics that we experience. Now, I grant you there's a lot of evidence that has built that mindset in our country. I, it didn't happen by accident. It wasn't sort of something that, that happened overnight. Um, we've nurtured that idea. <laughs> we've fed it. We have believed in it. We've leaned into it, that there are winners and the losers are just inconsequential. There's a lack of respect. So when we look at this idea of a mental equivalent, what I want to encourage you to do is to look at the thoughts that you're carrying. I know it is not an easy task. 
I can't tell you how many times I see a bumper sticker for something that opposes what I currently believe around political ideas, and something in me gets, ew. <laughs> and then I remember. You know, you, uh, uh, Reverend Judy, you, you, I really appreciate your opening this morning around um, thinking about all the animals that are... Um, experience the consequences of that fire. It's, it's that kind of mindfulness when we think past the issue, when we think past the concern, when we think past the, the knee-jerk reaction to what it is we really want to experience. This philosophy will support you in that. It will support you in creating a different experience around, and, and it may be uh, this is just for, this is what happens for me. Some, I change my mind, and there's a lot of people that don't change their mind, and they have a different experience for me. It's a completely different experience, I guarantee you. And when they share their different experience with me, I don't argue with them. I simply say, hmm, that's really not my experience. And I continue to build the mental equivalent about the world, a world that works for everyone. That probably sounds like a pretty airy, fairy line, doesn't it? How can the world work for everyone? Well, look at the Olympics again. There are many um, examples in this world that you will find. Some of them are very small. You have to look for them. You have to help create them. You have to lean into them. You have to change your thinking around what you're experiencing. If you want to experience love and connection, then that needs to be where you operate from. We live in a perfectly imperfect world. And all the imperfections that we see around us are opportunities. They're opportunities for us to acknowledge the imperfection and then to move our minds in a different direction. I know that the world demands a lot of us. There's bills to pay, there's challenges that we have in relationships, there's work that we have to deal with. There's lots of challenges. And every single one of them you can meet with a mindset of how you want to experience it. Recently, um, we in, in Centers for Spiritual Living, um, many of you know that I am the chair of the Leadership Council, which is effectively the board of trustees for our entire international movement. And um, we, our, we have a group that works with our spiritual leader, who is my colleague and helps me lead our organization, who works with a group called the Socially... Hmm, I always get the S's backwards. It's the Spiritually Motivated... Spiritually Motivated Socially Engaged community. So that this, yeah, I know, you won't be able to repeat it. Let me try one more time. We, I just call it the SMSE, right? <laughs> SMSE is the spiritually motivated uh, social engagement. And so, um, you know, there's a, there's a, there seems to be, you know, our movement seems to be changing a little bit and some people aren't real happy with it. They're sort of like, wait a minute, I thought all I had to do was pray. I thought all I had to do was change my mind. We have a beautiful spiritual vision of a world that works for everyone. And one of my favorite quotes, and I believe it's Socrates, he was asked by his student, how do I get to Mount Olympus? And Socrates simply responded, make sure every step is in that direction. And so when we talk about social engagement, we're not talking about doing something other than consciousness. We're talking about consciousness in motion. We're talking about being engaged in the world like those athletes, knowing the highest and the best for each one, knowing that there's a different way we can experience it because it lives in you. Even if you are vaguely aware of it, it lives in you. 
And so this just came out from the SMSE, <laughs> easier to say. Um, and it was in our newsletter. If you're not getting the international organization's newsletter, it's chock full of wisdom and inspiration. And so this statement just came out, and I want to read it to you. We stand for people, peace, and love. And they quote Ernest Holmes, find me one person who is for something and against nothing, who is redeemed enough not to condemn others out of the burden of his soul. And we'll read that one more time, because it's a powerful quote. Find me one person who is for something and against nothing, who is redeemed enough not to condemn others out of the burden of their soul. The statement goes on to say, Ernest Holmes suggests that any time we fight or resist something, we only cause it to grow and fester. However, what we resist persists, and more discord could result. Humans tend to take sides in conflicts, creating stories about which side is right and which side is wrong based on their personal beliefs. When this happens, there's no room to see nuance, and we fail to understand suffering is not limited to just one side. Rather than declaring what we are against, let us fir be firm about what we stand for. We stand for people. All people have the right to exist in freedom, to have a home, to have food, and to walk safely to school. All people have the right to live in peace and harmony. All people have the right to self-determination. We stand for peace. The power of the heart of, of the divine source. We visualize peace in the world. We can see peaceful activities in all parts of the world. We can create a spiritual chain reaction for peace. We stand for love. Love is compassionate, kind, forgiving, and holds no rancor. Love is the all-encompassing power for good in the universe. We stand for something. We do not stand by and do nothing. We can engage in the most powerful practice of all, affirmative prayer, to create the atmosphere to work toward what we stand for. Affirmative prayer is not inaction, ignor ignorance, or spiritual bypass. However, prayer is not enough. We must also act in the world to create positive change. To create a world that works for all, we must understand the world, not hide from it. Let's partner with organizations doing good work in the world and educate ourselves on global issues. Holmes wrote that when praying, everyone must bring themselves to a place in mind where there is no misfortune, no calamity, no accident, no trouble, or no confusion. Where there is nothing but plenty, peace, power, life, and truth. We offer these powerful five-step spiritual practice of sacred activism. One, we sit in the stillness in the silence and allow our thoughts and emotions to bring up the intense feeling of love. Two, we stay with this feeling of love until it envelopes our being. Three, we engage our imagination and see this energy of love surrounding those places where it is needed. Four, we express gratitude for the love and peace that is now present in our world. And five, we turn this love and gratitude into action in ways that bring about positive change. Let us affirm together, I am a vessel of peace and love. I choose to radiate compassion, understanding, and kindness in all my interactions. My heart is open, my mind is calm, and my spirit is at peace. I attract love, harmony, and unity into my life. I spread these gifts to those around me. I am rooted and grounded in love. That is our invitation today, to be rooted and grounded in love, to know the, that truth of our spiritual beingness, to Recognize that we forget that when we get so wrapped up in our human beingness that there is something larger than you 
in the moment with whatever is in front of you that may seem insurmountable. You don't have to try to move through that alone. Reverend Judy again gave a great example of something that was heavy on her heart. And she brought it to us and she offered it up for us to lift up, to have a wonderful healing prayer around all the displaced animals and wildlife. We can do that with any situation where we can pull together. My mentor always liked to say, there was the power of the two or more. You know, we can always remember that, that there is power in the two or more. When two or more come together in the name of love, when two or more come together in the name of beauty, when two or more come together in the name of understanding, we can create a different experience. We start with ourselves, and then we radiate that outward. That is our philosophy in its next generation taking the power and the presence of all these beautiful principles and walking them out into the world in whatever works for you. You don't have to march or protest. Some of us work in consciousness. Some of us work within systems. Some of us work outside the systems, pushing the systems. But let's know that this experience that we're having in this political landscape can be different. We may not see the results right away, kind of like the spiritual practice we've been doing all year, and suddenly I began to see the results of it. But if we continue to put one foot in front of the, of the other and continue to walk in the direction of our vision, we will get there. Thank you very much. Well, I don't know if I can do much better than that beautiful prayer from our SMSC group, but I'm going to go ahead and ride the wave of that and share a prayer with us right now. So if you'll just lower your gaze or close your eyes and join me in this spiritual practice of affirmative prayer, knowing with me that the power and the presence of the one mind and the one heart that is forever imbuing itself, forever pouring itself into all life is everywhere present. It doesn't experience loss. It doesn't experience limitation. It just is. And so knowing that this power and this presence, this immutable life force that makes the grass grow and breathes our body and pumps blood through our heart and all the experiences that we have in the world, knowing that there is some place within that is deeply spiritual, deeply abiding, deeply powerful. And as we recognize ourselves in that power, I know for each one that our minds are opened and our hearts are opened and we know exactly what is ours to do. We start in love. We start with the idea of joy, of beauty, of all those beautiful God qualities, and we allow our hearts to guide us. And I trust I trust in this power and this presence. I know that it always shows up. It always delivers. And so I claim right now a deliverance for each one, regardless of whatever you're experiencing, knowing that we are each lifted up, that we carry each other, that we hold each other, that we know the connectedness that we have with one another. As we move through what may seem like difficult times, the truth is, we are one. And I celebrate that. I celebrate that with my whole heart and my whole body. I know this for myself. I know this for each one, that there is no other. That we continue to look in the mirror, in the mirror of humanity, in the mirror of the world, and we continue to see ourselves reflected back. This is true power. I'm grateful for it. I recognize it. I lift it up. And together we say, and so it is.